Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so three, four specific announcements. February 13th, next Tuesday is Shop Fun Day. Woo -woo! So there is still a sign up here for things to bring. Um, if you're watching online, there's a sign up on the Slack app. Yep. Um, and there's a new depths hashtag. New depths ha hashtag. Hashtag new depths. Mm -hmm. uh, to sign up for things to bring, but pizza is provided and people are bringing other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, February 22nd is National Collegiate Day of Prayer. Wright State, there will be an event on Wright State campus to pray. We can go to that. We'll have more details on that, but just be focused. We're praying specifically for Wright State, UD, um, what other campuses? Sinclair. Sinclair, uh, Cedarville. Cedarville. Wellington. What's that? Wellington. Wilmington, maybe. That's pretty close. Mm -hmm. Different <laughs> local church or uh, colleges that we'll be praying for. Um, we'll actually hit those two. I think that's a Thursday or a Tuesday. I'll look it up and you can take So it's one day that we're here. So that. Also coming up from March to Thursday. Okay, so we will focus on that here as well. Thursday night, we'll, we'll hit praying for those specific things. March 3rd through the 24th is our, what we'll be talking about tonight, our uh, corporate fast. Let's just, I'm just going to call it our sacred assembly or solemn assembly. Prayer meetings. Every day during that period, 6 a.m., 6 p.m., and 10 p.m., seven days a week for that 21-day period. It's calling the community to fast and pray and to engage in that. Um, actually asking uh, our community and family to, to commit. We're actually meeting with ministry leaders from different organizations to commit to fasting through that period, asking for the Lord to break through in our region and our city. Um, and to commit to say, I'll be at a prayer meeting, one prayer meeting a day for 21 days. Pick, you can pick one, whatever, or say, hey, every Tuesday I'm going to do the 6 a.m., on Wednesdays I'm going to do the 6 p.m., and the rest of the days I'm going to do the 10 p.m., whatever, just to kind of commit to certain time periods and then just do that for 21 days. Uh, that's a stretch, that's a reach for a lot of us, but that's okay. Um, we're trying to shape those around a working community. So before work, after work, and then nighttime, uh, nighttime, I think, I think that's, I think the 10 p.m. is going to be our busiest set, in my opinion, because I think all the students are going to say, oh, dude, 10 o'clock, yeah. I have just my thoughts. Um, so it's, and honestly, there's a little bit of a Psalm 84 taste and see season where I think people are going to get stirred up and say, this is what it's like to be in a, a night and day community of prayer and worship and get really zealous for it. That's part of my heart. It's not really the reason that we're doing it, but I think that's going to happen. Um, it would be a huge, cool benefit. Okay, and then the other thing is March 10th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is what we're calling the Spirit and Truth Worship Workshop. It's a Saturday in Tip City at the um, at Upper Room Worship Center in Tip City. Uh, Spirit and Truth Worship Workshop. We're actually collaborating with H2O Church, with Upper Room, uh, Upper Room Worship Center, uh, collaborating with IFI is getting involved, and mm, I won't say who else, but we are having a meeting next week with another guy who is pretty well known dude in the worship community as well. Um, but to the, Corey Asbury will be there. Corey Asbury <laughs> and Matt Gilman and Oakland. Right. right, sure. Hey, you want to come teach Harper Bowl? Awesome. Yeah. Um, Matt's, Matt's done that before. He's out here. Vineyard. Um, but uh, part of this is in preparation for March 24th, we're doing a 12-hour burn with H2O Church on Wright State Campus. We're going to be doing 12 hours of worship and prayer with them on campus in the classrooms. Um, and so part of this dynamic will be training for that. They're requiring students that want to help lead that to come and take this training. So... There's a little bit of harping bowl training dynamic, but it's teaching how do we sing the word, how do we prayer lead, how do we sing in the spirit, uh, what what does it mean to sing the new song, uh, the tequila of scripture. Everybody, I love that. Say tequila. Tequila. No, not tequila. 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 Okay. So singing the tequila, singing the new song. Uh, we're gonna hit how do we how do we sing as a team? 
dynamic, right? How do we do this as a team? But also the, the, the first half will be focused primarily on how do you do this in your own life, personal life, singing the word, singing in the spirit, those dynamics. So that's March 10th. Keep that on your calendar. That's going to be a big deal. Uh, we're really excited about it. Be praying for us as we organize and structure. Uh, I'm, it's looking like this is a conference kind of style thing, and we might have 100 people. <laughs> Let's, I'd be happy if we have 20 people. But if H2O is bringing who they say they're bringing, and IFI is bringing who they say they're bringing, and Upper Room is saying these are the people we're bringing, it's going to be a little bigger than I think. Uh, that's a lot of figuring stuff out in a month. So please be praying for us. Food will be provided in that dynamic, and it's also free. Um, so, Should we say props to H2O for that? Is that H2O still on it shows that they would help or do food. I'm, I'm pretty I'm sure he straight up said he was going to do Pretty sure he said they would do food. Oh, so. If you need any help with logistics or like day of coordinating, I can help. Yeah, well, I, I'm yeah. good. I'm good at busting people around. Sweet. <laughs> I love I, I would love an event coordinator. <laughs> sure. So um, I'm okay. putting together a meeting for point people from each ministry okay. in the next week. Okay. So there will be at least one person from each of those ministries. I'd like to get them together here to just sure. lay stuff out. Okay. So. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna pray and then let's actually start in the notes. If you do want the notes, you're watching online, they are available on the Slack app under the hashtag general tab or thread. Uh, I posted them there about an hour ago. So God, we just invite your presence. Lord, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light. God, we just thank you for your word and we ask that you would reveal light to our spirits truth to our hearts, that you would pierce us with revelation of who we are before you, of your plans and your purposes, and of what you have set for us to do. God, just open us up to hear from you. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see truth from your word and from your law. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is the 24th, that's a Saturday, right? Yes. Okay. Correct. And it's Sneaking up really fast. <laughs> okay, I looked at the calendar today. I'm like, it's the eighth. Ugh. So it's been a month. It's a month. Um, ten. Wait, yeah, that that Saturday or Saturday, the third. We'll start planning the next one of these on the 25th. Yes. Of March. Yes. And then it'll, it'll be. Yeah. We'll have a year. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm also teaching that weekend. Um, the following Monday, the following Sunday awesome. at church, I'm like, oh, all right, Lord, we're halfway into a fast. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah. Throw me out, Lord. <laughs> in, your I, I, in my weakness, he will be made yeah. strong. Oh, man, and we'll be not having all of our uh, crutches we usually have to. Yeah. <laughs> Glory, Glory to the Lamb. Our flesh right. will be burned at your worst. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even start talking about the fast yet tonight. Come on, guys. Okay, well, I'm going to start. Uh, the, the title tonight is Blow the Trumpet in Zion, Consecrated Fast, Call the Sacred Assembly. It's out of Joel 2. Um, but I want to start by looking at Psalm 2 and the relationship of Psalm 2 to Joel 2 unto Acts 2. So Psalm 2, we'll, I want to unpack a little bit, but it is the, the crisis in the nation. It's what's happening in the, work, in the earth between God and man and kings of the earth and Jesus' response. Um, and then Joel 2 is our response, how we respond to the Psalm 2 dynamic in the nation. And then Acts 2 is what God does at the end of Joel 2 in response is pouring out his spirit. Look at, look at the dynamics of Acts 2, right? It's the upper room and it's the day of Pentecost. Now, I just realized I don't have anything about Acts 2 on this paper. <laughs> I have Joel 2 and Psalm 2, but I don't actually dive into Acts 2. But just know that the answer, the end of it, is that reality. So, um, and I'm laying this out tonight and beginning to, to, to put this forth as explanation and understanding as to why we are not only calling the fast that we're calling from March 3rd to the 24th, but also saying we're going to do more than we normally do. And we're going to actually be in the prayer room three times a day for an hour or two hours at a time, and we're committing to do those, those prayer steps. Why are we gathering together in the context of us fasting? It's one thing to fast, but it's another to actually then, in the, in the, in the uh, time frame of the fast, to gather together. And we'll see that as we get into Joel 2. 
So Psalm 2 uh, <clears throat> paints a vivid picture of the behind-the-scenes reality taking place in the book of Joel. Okay, so Joel 1 to 2. Um, it, it shows what's happening in the hearts and minds. In it, King David, uh, in Psalm 2, King David prophesied that world leaders would oppose the leadership of Jesus, particularly in the end times, causing a global crisis that would reach its pinnacle in the generation of the Lord's return. Okay, so Psalm 2 has four parts. I believe Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, maybe, I can't remember who it was, wrote this out. It's like, the, it's the great um, four acts, four part act or play of of the Psalms, right? And he writes it out like it's a like it's a production. So Act One is um, is Psalm Two, One to Three, okay? And it's titled "The King's Opposition to J the Kings of the Earth, Their Opposition to Jesus' Leadership." Part Two or Act Two of the play would be the Father's response. Part Three is Jesus' res Jesus's response and what he says to the Father, and then Part Four is David's exhortation to the kings of the earth. So Part One or Act One of Psalm 2, David prophesies that the nations will rise up in anger against Jesus' leadership. Right. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm 2, and you should have your Bible, or a Bible. This is basically church, and I know every pastor always says that, and nobody ever has their Bible, so no, no. I, I never do. I have my phone. It's okay. Okay, so... He's prophesying relating to the, talking about the, the end times and, and the kings of the earth will actually rise up against Jesus and his leadership. <clears throat> Particularly in verse three, you'll see against Jesus's standards of morality and God's standards and purposes related to Jerusalem, which you see in verse two and verse six. So verse one to three, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So just break this down a little bit. They're gathered against the Lord and his Christ. Jesus gave more warnings about deception in the end of the age than about tribulation, about trouble, about judgment. Okay, And what you see in this is that they're gathering because they're deceived. And they're, how do you gather against a guy coming in the sky with billions of people? and not get a clue that you can't stand against them. Deception is, is really the answer, right? In their deceived state, uh, kings, rulers, and leaders will actually plot against the Father, right? The Lord and Jesus, his anointed, causing rage that will escalate beyond their own voicing opinions to actually people warring against God. And we're seeing that now with hate crimes, with prison, prison dynamic in this nation is insane uh, with death and murder against the church, right? So we're beginning to see some of that expression walk down now. Um, is there an extra set of notes? If not, I'll go ahead and print one. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to print one anyway because I think Warren needs one. There's two back here, so I okay. And don't print five copies because we'll listen to that all day. <laughs> Just do one. Okay, uh, so there, uh, Roman numeral one, number letter A, number one. There we go. That's where I was. Um, so, just to see that in the Bible, Matthew twenty four nine, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. They will, you will be hated by all nations, and then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. This is all concerning that generation, that time frame uh, that, that David's prophesying of in Psalm two. Um, so the other dynamic thing that I want to look at in Psalm, in verse 1 to 3 is break their bonds and cast away their cords. So this is really related. These The, the primary gathering of the kings of the earth and the leaders of the earth to, into plot, what they're plotting against is the word and the influence of the word in the culture. Okay, so you, you're, we're, actually we see that right now in the West where governmental agencies and leaders in the nation and, and popularity or in in Hollywood or whatever, right? What do they rage against? In Jesus, they're raging against the word because they view the word as cords of bondage, right? Oh, these are heavy weights to bear, or oh, that's legalism. Even in the church, there's there's a rising up against the word in some some sects and some dynamics because we see we don't see the word and, and Jesus's word in love, but we see God's word in a negative light, as though it were bonds or it, enslaving us or hindering us from our you know, human potential. We see it as cords binding us to his morality, 
to his godly ways, to his truth. So the main plot against God will be the focus to remove or entirely cast away the influence of his word from society. That's the main plot, of, of which is in vain, right? The king's plot in vain. Uh, and, and Okay, so an unholy agenda is accelerating as many attack God's, this is my own quote, I'm reading it, uh, commands to, to, <laughs> and seek to remove his moral boundaries from society, including the sanctity of life, marriage, and sexuality. Right? That's how we're seeing that already. Before, <clears throat> and I said this last week, so this is a little bit of review, but before Jesus returns, both godliness and sin will reach their greatest heights in history, resulting in a falling away from the faith, right? The, the wheat and the tares will come up together. Um, thus, both light and darkness will increase at the same time. In the latter time, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king or the Antichrist shall arise, right? Or in 1 Timothy, Timothy writes, or Paul writes, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry, and which is a fascinating concept, by the way, just forbidding marriage entirely. When you start to see that, wake up. <laughs> um, but this is, again, concerning that time frame. This is what he's prophesying of. This is what you're going to see, right? This is how the kings of the earth are acting, even in our day. Okay? But the Father responds to Psalm 2, 4 to 6. So the first act was the king's response to God and to his word and to Jesus, right? And act two of this play is the father's response. And his, his response is this. He promises revival and judgment. Okay? He who sits in heavens shall laugh and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress, distress them in his displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy mountain. Of Zion, on the holy hill of Zion, sorry, I'm reading two different versions. Uh, David declared that the Father's purpose, again, this is David's song, Father's purpose was to mag purposes to magnify Jesus over kings of the nation and to distress rebellious kings with judgment. That was what God's going to do, or is what God's going to do. Jesus was enthroned in heaven at the resurrection and will be enthroned in Jerusalem on the earth when he returns. And the kings don't like that, but God is set in his ways. He says, this is what I'm going to do, just so you know. Right? So the Father's response to them includes openly demonstrating Jesus' power as king. And he's going to pressure the leaders of society who are permanently settled in their rage against Jesus and his truth. And we won't go into this tonight, but the sources of those pressure, there's, there's a phrase called the, the four eschatological winds. It's like a really big phrase that whatever. There's basically meaning there's four dynamics that are converging to create pressure in the end times. And it's man's sin, creation's groan, Satan's rage, and God's zeal. I have those listed there with a verse to kind of go with each of them. But man's sin becomes fully ripe, causing a great falling away from the faith because we're seduced and, and, and we're persecuted by, you know, the heart of Babylon and all of those dynamics of, of the end times. And so man's sin is increased to... Fullness creation is groaning with the anticipation of the revealing of the sons of God. So creation's groaning, the birth pangs begin, uh, all of those dynamics. So you've got that, you've got Satan is raging. Why? Because he knows his time is short and the Lord basically unleashes him in that season, uh, to, to put it pretty simply. But he's unleashed against Israel and against the church. He's raging against those dynamics. Um, and then God's zeal is actually causing pressure as well because God is zealous for a pure and spotless bride for his son. And so he starts shaking everything that can be shaken so that what's good will remain, right? So I will pour out my spirit on all flesh um, or all nations. Joel 2, 28, I will show wonders in the heaven, signs in the earth before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Okay, so these are all happening before Jesus shows up on the scene. Um, one of my favorite verses, as always, they're all my favorite verses, but Haggai 2.7, God says, I will shake the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, which is Jesus, the desire of nations. So the purpose of God shaking in his zeal is what? Why does he shake? To point people to Jesus. To point people to Jesus. Okay, so trouble comes, and some of it God causes, like purposefully does, is to shake is not, you don't shake accidentally. You shake. It's a violent 
word, right, is, is what the word for shake is, okay? So God is shaking things, but the purpose of the shaking is, hey, slap the cup of drunkenness from your hand. Wake up. Look to my son, the desire of nations. So God's people in this time are to be faithful witnesses of the truth about his character, God's character, his nature, and his plans. Because even in his wrath, he will speak to the leaders of society through his people. So God's, God's wrath will be enacted against wickedness and ungodliness, right? Not against the righteous, but the wrath of God is, is, is kept for the wicked, right? But even in that, he's going to raise up leaders who speak truth to, to governmental leaders. He's going to raise up uh, prophetic messengers who proclaim to society his character, his nature, and his plans. Why? Because he's merciful. I mean, he's in his wrath, he's merciful. So one primary characteristic of a false prophet, and this is kind of a side note, is that they prophesy only blessing to people, even to those who refuse God's leadership, without ever speaking of his judgments. So we have to speak. The, the, the truth is, if you're operating in prophecy, I'm not saying you're a prophet. There's different stages. There's, there's prophetic ministry. There's the office of the prophet. And then there's just general prophecy, which is for exhortation, encouragement, and comfort. I don't generally see guys that are just doing general prophecy it's not their place to <laughs> prophesy judgment now if you have a ministry of prophecy like that's one of your primary callings or you're the office of a prophet okay let's let's heed some of that but a false prophet that would be an office right a higher ranking and however you want to categorize that i don't know that's helpful though because i always i've heard some of this and when we do prophecy at like new depths i'm like supposed to be mean to people, <laughs> but it's like, that's more for the big guys. So just to, just to unpack that, I'm going to erase this. Um, just, let me just unpack that really quickly, okay? I think that's helpful, though. So there's, there's three categories, right? There's the office, and I'm, I'm overgeneralizing this, so just, just hear me, office of the prophet, okay? These are guys like Joel, <coughs> right, and Jeremiah. And I'll say, okay, for a modern prophet. Who's, Louis no, Louis he's dead now. Maybe Lou Engle, right? Lou Engle's a prophet, I would say. To some, he's a prophet to, to nations. Some extent, yeah. You know, so they will operate in, in an office, but then there's a prophetic ministry. Okay? These are guys who... Uh, have extended periods or seasons of lots of dreams or visions who uh, get fairly common uh, prophetic words of knowledge um, and who are on the road to this. Okay? You can train to become a prophet biblically. Okay? So they're on the road to prophetic ministry as an office. But they're operating in prophetic ministry. They just, James Griffith, who's here, James is this. He's, he operates in a prophetic ministry. He's constantly having dreams. I mean, on a regular basis, prophetic dreams that are really powerful. The Lord gives him vision. He gives him insight into different dynamics and things. He is not an off, in the office of the prophet, and he knows that, right? But he has a prophetic ministry. It's his primary, one of his primary ministry attributes and aspects of his character. Okay? But then there's just prophecy. This is 99% of what prophecy happens, particularly here, right? Tuesday night, as we're doing training, how do you hear the Lord's voice and then just repeat it? I mean, that's everybody should be operating in this. When Paul's talking about prophecy, Paul says prophecy is for exhortation, encouragement, and comfort. Why? To build up the body. It is you listening to what the Lord is saying and then exhorting the church to walk in her wholeness and, and calling, right? Just listening and imparting, listening and imparting. And we should all be operating in that to some extent. So this is, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. How about it's 90%? This is 9% and this is 1% if we had to break it down. Though this is probably way less than 1%. <laughs> <clears throat> that kind of lack of progression of how it will go. Like if you start off with the, I guess, the gift of prophecy and... Mm -hmm. Move up to prophetic ministry, and you can't. I think or you it's can't not necessarily like I mean, a set way of how it goes, but right. I think we all have we all have access to this in our tool belt. 
right? The Lord, like all of the spiritual gifts, we can all operate in healing. We should all be able to operate in prophecy, in words of knowledge. We should all be able to operate, this is a hard one, in um, administration. <laughs> we should all be able to operate in, um, right? or, or, or uh, hospitality. <laughs> I'm an introvert, so, right? But there, those are available. And if we're just breaking this down into the fivefold, let's just talk about the fivefold ministry. You've got apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, a pest, okay? Somewhere in your, your think of them as, um, you guys ever heard of Myers-Briggs? Yeah. Personality test or whatever. Like you have strength space <clears throat> leadership. It's like what your strength is. Right. Yeah. You have strengths somewhere in as apostolic leadership, prophetic leadership, uh, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. Right? My primary bet is a teacher. That's just where I'm at in this season. However, I went through a private where through a season where my primary focus was in prophecy. I wasn't a prophet, but I was floating around this area. And it was a short, really short season, but it was this area. And then whatever. But my, my point is this: Jesus is all five all the time. Perfectly. He's perfectly apostle, perfectly prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. Which means, if we're to grow to be more like Jesus, you might, I might have a current strength of teaching, but I should be working on apostolic, prophetic, evangelist, and shepherd to grow them. That doesn't mean I'm always going to be an office of the prophet or the office of, of apostle or office of teacher or whatever. Da, 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 right? We may never. But, yeah. but our personality and our strengths are able to be grown, and so we should be focusing on those dynamics. Now, if you believe you're called to the office of the prophet, there's a pro I think there's a process of growth. There's a training schools. I mean, dynamics, even in the word for that. And there's sitting under leaders who are prophets to impart. I mean, I'm just, anyway, right? You want to grow as an evangelist, what do you do? You hang out with evangelist people mm -hmm. who are, you. I mean, and evangelists are the easy, well, second to prophets, the easiest ones to spot. Prophets are super weird guys. Like, if it's a, like, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Bob Jones or ever seen, I mean, let's say Rick Joyner was in the office of prophet. Or, or um, I don't know, I can't think of any of the other ones off the top of my head, from the, like the Kansas City Prophets back in the 80s and 90s. Like, they're weird-looking dudes, and they're kind of kooky and strange. And uh, we got a friend, Darwin, who is, I would say, definitely office of prophet. He's kind of kooky and weird and whatever, right? So they're pretty easy to spot. Evangelists are probably the easiest to spot, the outgoing, energetic, like, get them souls, man! Like, just crazy. And, like, we got, we've got one at our church who I love him so much, and he is an evangelist through and through, not me, but I will hang out with him all day long. Because I'm like, can I just get some of the glory of the salvations that are coming off? Like, you know, like, yeah! Anyway, all right. That was a totally side tangent, unrelated, but somewhat related. Because I was talking about false prophets. The dynamic of that the reality is, if you're here and all you're speaking are positive dynamics, never speaking of God's judgment, never speaking of sin and the need for repentance, that's false. That's being a false prophet. Mm -hmm. And you can do that from here. You, sh If you're in this dynamic, if prophetic ministry is one of your main ministries, you should potentially, I'd say 1% to 2%, maybe 5%, maybe sometimes 20% of those dreams, visions, words of knowledge are going to be words of warning. And speak them. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Even as teachers, we have to be aware of that. As shepherds, right, we have to warn. The Bible gives just as many warnings as it does exhortations. So we have to be aware of that dynamic and share them. We can't walk in just, just encouragement. Now, again, if you're here, don't warn me. I mean, maybe, maybe on a one-off, but you shouldn't be giving those types of words. And usually if it is, it's someone you're in a relationship with. Right. And, and sometimes you're not actually prophesying. You just know things about them <laughs> that are bad and you they need to fix. And that's that's okay, too. Faithful are the wounds of friends, right? I mean, you should wound, if you're friends, you should wound one another. Now, sometimes, I just shared this the other day, a, a, a good friend of ours and a prior leader um, who was a, a spirit, kind of a spiritual father to us posted years ago, and I shared the tag again, Corey's, Corey Stark, mm -hmm. um, Sometimes 
the, the best advice or best critical response, whatever you'll receive comes from people who say it in a wrong way, in a mean, mean spirit, in a wrong way, but it's like the best way that you can grow. And I can't, I can't quote him directly. Lauren's going to look it up, but look it, up. it was, it's really good. And I just posted it again. I'm like, Oh man, he's taking me to school every day. Like still, you know, sometimes those words that people give that really hurt probably reveal a lot about you. Mm-hmm. If that's Especially your emotional and heart response to it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Often the things we're most offensive about, it's because it's digging in there kind of kind of deep. Mm-hmm. Here we go. You will often receive the most profound insights about yourself from people who give it to you in the wrong way. There you go. Amen. And what's funny is he... Uh, I posted it again. Like I he commented it. on it, and he's like, "Man, I'm still living that one." <laughs> so we, we the, the point of it is this: we we must speak the difficult and offensive themes of the gospel, as well as the more popular ones. Uh, the church's effectiveness lies in her calling to be against the world, yet for it. Uh, both world affirming and world denying. You've probably heard those phrases before. Uh, when the church neglects this dual stance, it results in cowardice and compromise. Okay, I'm going to skip those passages. Part three, or act three of Psalm two. Okay, again, it's a four part play, really. Four acts. Well, or three acts, and then David's conclusion, maybe. You can put it that way. Uh, act three, letter C there, is Jesus' response to the Father's message, and that is to intercede. So David overhears the holy dialogue, or trialogue? <laughs> it's like the Trinitarian dialogue, whatever that is. Basically, think or of it. Is it a monologue? Is it a monologue? <laughs> That's a good point, because it's God talking to God. Anyway, sorry. But basically, David overhears Father, Son, and Holy Spirit kind of having this conversation and what's going on between God and Jesus. And he records one of the most important statements about Jesus and how Jesus rules the nations. So I'll just read it, Psalm 2, 7. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, this is Jesus speaking, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, Uh, uh, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. So Jesus here declares the Father's decree And we see Jesus, the great intercessor, actually engage in praying for the full release of God's promised dominion over all the nations to be manifest openly. So he's praying for his own leadership to be displayed, his own authority that he already had, but he had to ask for. Is that crazy? Like God had to ask God for what God already gave God. I don't know. (laughs) Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to ask. And he enters into actual intercession for his own um, uh, authority, for his own power to be manifest, displayed. He enters into it to gain his own inheritance. Jesus' response to the Father's message and the global rebellion is to enter into intercession. He sees the kings of the earth in rebellion, and his answer to that is to pray. The most powerful created, uncreated being who became a man ever said, my answer to the anger of the nations is to pray. And you wonder why the nations rage. You wonder why the kings of the earth are angry because the answer is prayer and worship. (laughs) And they're like, that's stupid, (laughs) right? So this this gives us really a lot of insight into how much he prioritizes his call to to people to partner with him in prayer. It's so important that God actually says to Jesus, ask of me, and I will give you the nation. It hindered upon him actually asking. Justice hindered upon Jesus asking for it. We see it in Luke 18. Will not God bring up, not bring about, bring about, Typo. Bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night. Surely he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? And we did Luke 18. We broke down Luke 18 a couple months ago. So I encourage you to go back and listen to that. I don't know if I had notes for that. Um, but no. I don't think you actually video recorded it. Was oh, that the one you did audio recording on? Could have. That's what I thought that one was. 
Clarity, part four, act four, or the conclusion, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, is David's exhortation. So David witnesses Psalm 2, 1 through through, through 9, right? He sees these, these three parts, and he sees what's going on, and then what does he do? He stops, and he, and he, he stops telling the story, and he looks at you, the reader, or the kings, and he says, Now be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judge of the earth. Judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. David finishes this epic by giving a solemn warning to the kings and leaders and the rulers of the earth and to us. He says, you better pay attention to not enter into this. You better enter into his love. You better serve him with kind or with gladness. You better kiss the son, lest he be angry. Kiss the son, meaning bow down and submit now. Or what's he going to do? He's coming with a rod of iron to break your knee and make you bow. I said that before. It's a harsh language, but really that's what he's doing. David exhorts leaders to serve or fully engage with God in the fear of the Lord, okay, which is clean and the beginning of wisdom, and in joy, to rejoice in serving the Lord. Okay, so so you should it should be a little bit of trembling and fear, but there should also be a joyful engagement with it. So in context, this includes speaking God's message and engaging in prayer with Jesus. So that's Psalm 2. That's what's happening. Now we're going to look at Joel. Okay, so the, the, the layout here is Psalm 2 and our response in Joel 2 and then God's response in Acts 2. Okay, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is also Joel 2, by the way, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> it's the fulfillment of Joel 2. Okay, so the overview, just overview of the book of Joel. Just turn with me to Joel if you're not already there. I know I had mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, just encouraging people to try to read through the book of Joel every day. It's just three chapters. Just try to read through it every day. Um, and I would give yourself to that for another month. I'm trying and failing, just so you know. And it's only three chapters. <laughs> I'm trying and failing. I'm trying to read through Isaiah, too, and I'm failing that. So God forgive us, but we love you and we love you more. Yeah, Isaiah's a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to read, like, <laughs> sections It's like, that's Isaiah. all you're doing that day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I joke about that, but I remember hearing um, some leaders talking about that, <clears throat> just giving themselves hours a day. Yeah. Just read the word. Just Four hours a day. I'm just gonna sit down and just read it. Yeah. Like, oh, God help me. Mm -hmm. I want to want to do that. I don't even want to do that sometimes. I just I want to want to do that. I want a love. For, God, give us a love for you, Lord, that we would delight in your law. So the basic structure of Joel is Joel one is a natural disaster, so locust plague and a drought that leads to economic crisis. That's what's happening in Joel one. Joel 2 to 11 is a military crisis in which God actually raises up a Babylonian invasion. Okay, God brings forth the invasion. Joel's prophesying about it. it decades out, okay, decades out, but he's prophesying about this Babylonian invasion that will come. Uh, his, his contemporaries were Habakkuk and Zephaniah. They prophesied about it generations out, and then Jeremiah prophesied of it as it was happening, and it was too late. Jeremiah says, hey, the Lord says, don't repent, don't call on me, I won't hear. It's too late, you missed the boat. And you, I think that's Jeremiah too. Um, Joel came decades ahead of time. Habakkuk and Zephaniah came decades ahead of time and said, this is what's going to happen. People get ready. And many responded, and then a few, and then we'll get to that in a minute. But um, So two, verse, two, uh, verse 1 to 11 in chapter 2 is about the military crisis. The Babylonian invasion, but it's also foreshadowing the Antichrist empire at the end of the age that's going to rise up. So this is, Joel is not completely fulfilled. We know that, that it was partially fulfilled in, in 683, whatever it was, 600 something BC when the, the, the temple was destroyed. 638? I can't remember. Whenever the temple was destroyed. So it's partially fulfilled there. We fulfilled again through the Antichrist empire as it relates to the like end times, eschatology, just a big word for end times. Joel 2, 12 to 17 is God's required response. So first there's mil there's a natural disaster, and then there's military crisis that's coming, right? There's an invasion, and then God says, here's what I want you to do. Here's, my, here's what I require how you respond. 
in 2, or 12 to 17, in 18 to 32, you see God's blessing in response to the re required response. Okay, you see it, and that was in, in uh, fulfillment in that age. Also, we see that in the early church, and then you'll see it again in the end times. And then Joel 3 is really the end times, end times drama, the nations, judgment, and Israel. That's what that's concerning. So letter B, the salient theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. And we talked about this last week, but then, uh, the, the day of the Lord, but I'm going to give it just a brief review of it. Um, but mentioned five times, oh, five times in the book of Joel is the day of the Lord, and over a hundred times throughout the rest of the Bible. Okay? Um, it is his day. It's his day because God's power is displayed for all to see. It's about him. Okay? His day speaks of a time when God intervenes in history with unusual manifestations of power on behalf of his people and against his enemies. So the great and terrible dimensions of the day of the Lord will increase dramatically the closer you get to the return of Jesus. They'll find their fullest expression in the final three and a half years of natural human history right before Christ returns. Okay? So the, the great and terrible, the increasing dynamic of this. So it's a great day, 2.11. Why is it a great day? Well, those who love Jesus will witness the greatest outpouring of the Spirit in history leading up to his return. It's the greatest revival. It's the greatest move of God. It's the greatest movement, whatever you want to call it, uh, in history it will happen just before his return or in that season. Um in this great revival, the Spirit will release the miracles that were seen in the book of Acts and the book of Exodus, combined and multiplied on a global scale. Okay, Meaning, let's put it in the language that we talked about before, God will change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the whole earth in one generation. Because we don't see that right now. Can you say that again slower in case it's any so worries? In, in, in God. God releasing, He's going to release miracles, signs and wonders, power, that you see in the book of Acts and the books of, book of Exodus, multiply that by 10,000. That, what that means is when you look at the, what the church looks like right now, the church isn't doing that. The church isn't understood to be doing that. We're not expressing that. So in a moment, in one generation, God will change the understanding, how the world views it, and the expression, how we do it, Christianity, in the whole earth, everybody, all at once, in one single generation, right before he comes back. So it will literally, literally be the greatest time for the church in history, which is crazy. It is also a terrible day. Okay? It's a very terrible day. Those who rebel against Jesus in that hour will experience the most severe judgment ever on the earth since the beginning of human history. See that in Matthew 24, 21. Uh, you, also see, you also see that in Revelation 6 through, 12, 6 through 20. The whole, I mean, just Revelation. Books, yeah. The books, not verses. The books, the chapters. Um, so just a side note okay, on that. The projected population of the earth in 2025 is 10 billion people, okay? 10 billion, that's what we're projecting the population of the earth will be in 2025. That's just a few years away. Um, <clears throat> in the fourth seal judgment alone, so Revelation 6, 8, one quarter of the earth's population dies. One judgment, one quarter of the earth's population. That leaves 7.5 billion people, which is roughly what we have now, okay? So everybody born between now and 2025, gone. In one judgment. In the sixth trumpet, points to one-third of the remaining 7.5 million people on the earth being dying. That leaves 5 billion alive. So in just two of the 21 seals, trumpets, and bulls judgments at the end of the age that we see in the book of Revelation, half of the earth's population is killed. That does not include all the other dynamics involved Throughout that process, that's just those two judgments. Half of the Earth's population dies in a three and a half year period, or less than a three and a half year period, more like a three year period. Now, the death toll of these judgments will equal about five billion, if we're looking at it right, fifty percent, one in two people. That, like, just think of that, one in every two. So, you and one person next to you, one of you, right? <laughs> Not maybe that won't be. But so this room will be the. We'll be fine. We'll, be fine. we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, so, but one half of, of the original number that was alive before the Great Tribulation. Now, to give you perspective on that, the death toll of World War II in a six-year period from 1939 to 1945 was 50 million people. This is 
100 times that amount. Four million people will die a day. I used to be in the tombstone business. I'm missing out. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a joke. That's a bad joke. But the death business will be huge. What do you do with four million bodies a day? What do you do with that many deaths in a three-year period? No I mean, wonder I there's pestilence now. and death. What's that? How I many I die a day now, average, you know? I'll Google it. You can Google that. But I don't have to tell you. I don't want to interrupt you anymore. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's intense, though. So that's just to life. see, it that's very terrible. That's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay? But Jesus spoke of this uh, as an unprecedented time of trouble. Never before, never again will we see another time like this. The Lord will shake all the nations. But the context, again, of shaking the nations is for the multitudes to come to Jesus. The reason behind all of these shakings, all of these judgments, is to turn people's hearts. Now, not everyone does. Many do not. And you see that in Revelation over and over again. Um, I'll just read Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. Then there will be a great tribulation such has not been seen since the beginning of the world. This rightly should stir our hearts when we think of that. It should cause a little bit of trembling and a little bit of fear of the Lord. And, and, and rightly so, he's done that on purpose in his mercy. He's revealed these things to us to say, show this ahead of time, because when things start to happen, if you knew they were going to happen, guess what? You're not offended, and neither are those that you told, and they don't fall away. See, now, I'm giving you all of the terrible dynamics, but what did I say earlier what did Jesus warn more about deception. than all of the trouble? Deception. Jesus warned more of deception and was more concerned about being deceived in that time frame than he was about people dealing with the troubles. So we have to be on guard against those things. And, and the biggest part of being on guard against them is being in the Word, sitting in the book of Joel, sitting in the book of Revelation, reading it, sitting with the Lord on what he's prophesied through the Word, right? And just digesting it, loving his word with it, and receiving instruction from it. So, Roman numeral three, receiving instruction from the book of Joel. <clears throat> because how do we respond to that? Right? How, when we see these things, and the, the things that are coming, when we see the end times things that are coming, or we see the crisis in our nation, how then do we live? How then do we respond? And last week we talked about some of the heart dynamics of that. We'll touch on that again in the last two weeks. But there's a practical aspect to it as well. Okay. <clears throat> the Psalm 2 crisis requires a Joel 2 response, which results in an Acts 2 outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, That is the gist of what we're getting at. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read. I'll just actually read what I have here. I'm not going to read through all of Joel 2, because um, that would take a little while. But blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all of the inhabitants of the land tremble. Skip to verse 11 for the day of the lord is great and very terrible who can endure it now therefore says the lord turn to me with all your heart with fasting with weeping and with mourning this again is in response to the crisis and the military crisis and the coming judgment turn to me with all your heart with fasting with weeping with mourning blow the trumpet in zion consecrate a fast call a sacred assembly and it shall come to pass afterward that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters will prophesy and show wonders in the heavens and in the earth before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now that we get what's going on here now, that we've laid a little bit of that out, there's a response to all of the stuff, the terrible dynamics that we've talked about, when we see them coming, how we respond. Joel's message, letter A, is a clear revelation of God concerning his heart for the nations. Though blessings and or judgments may be several decades out, or several weeks, several years, Several decades. Let's just let's say let's hope for decades. Several decades out, God prescribes and even requires a certain response that must be done now, as our nation is in crisis. Okay, because there's a difference between our nation being in crisis and the great crisis of the end age. We th we seem to think that if America falls, that's Jesus coming back. That's why he's coming back. No, I don't see America mentioned in the Book of Revelation. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else besides that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Just saying, we're totally, it's, they could be related us. or maybe not, yeah. which means we could fall. So there's still a dynamic that, uh, of our response now. 
So the Spirit is calling the church to understand the coming revival and the coming crisis and respond in the way that Scripture teaches. So I've stated this before, but God requires wholeheartedness, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. Right? God wants our affection, he wants our love, and he desires us to give it all now, but in a long-term committed way. Okay? That's the required response of the heart. Okay? God is raising up a prophetic company. I'll just say it this way, how Joel says it. He wants you to rend your hearts. That's what God's after. Spiritual violence is not lackadaisical. Right? Rending of the heart is not passive. It's an active turning to the Lord, okay? And setting your heart before, the, however Misty says it, set your heart before the flame of God's love, you know? <laughs> your cold, cold heart, your cocoa hot. There you go. There you go. That, that's a funny story, I'll tell you another time. Okay, God is raising up, it, so in his mercy, God is raising up a prophetic company of preachers, of intercessors, of moms, of businessmen and women, of actors, artists, millionaires, street ministers, whatever, right, from all over the earth in order to sound the alarm of Joel, to blow the trumpet. The, now, the, the, the crux of this is these voices have to have clarity in their message, on their message, and God in their message. Okay, the Spirit of God on the proclamation is what will cause men and women to tremble and prepare for the coming days. You can speak till you're blue in the face, but if God is not in the message, people are, people's hearts will not be stirred and, and repent. Okay? So it's not about good communication skills or like having good like a lot of charisma or having cool tattoos <laughs> and being the hip guy. And it's not about like having really good charts and end times like maps, right? Ooh. Ooh. Even though I love charts and maps, okay? I love them. But Take that, John <laughs> sorry. It's not about good handouts. And I like good handouts. It's really not. Uh, I could I could type these all day long, and if God's not in the message, it's and and, and then yeah, and we also have to have clarity on the message, meaning we have to be in the Word, we have to gain the understanding. Okay, now to do that, I have here, and we're not going to break it down fully tonight, but these messengers, us, we must be living in three streams of prophetic end time or forerunner revelation, whatever, however you want to title that. But three streams of revelation. We have to have revelation of our identity, who we are before him, of the end times, meaning like we have to understand God's plans, and we have to have revelation from the Lord. And all three of these are continual, like stream continually flows. Once isn't enough. We have to constantly be seeking these three converging streams to empower us. And the third one is destiny or your function or assignment. Okay? If we gain understanding and we're walking in the understanding of identity, who I am before Christ, who I am always, right? Who I am as the beloved, as the bride of Christ, and I understand, have revelation of his plans and his purposes for the future and for the earth. And, and then on top of that, I know how my assignment and what I'm called to do fits into that plan. I'll stay steady for decades, upon decades, upon decades. Okay, there's other dynamics too, but these are three key key ones to focus on. We'll talk more about these in the coming weeks, but um, I believe these are three specific focuses for us to hit on and to, to set our hearts on during the sacred assembly, during the, the, the fast that we're calling from March 3rd to 21. <clears throat> because how do you how do you fast for 21 days when you've never done it before? You know who you are. You know what God's going to do, and you start learning what you're, how you fit into it. Lauren, do you have a question? Well, or just and like I feel like the obvious foundation of those three things has to be knowing who God is and requiring you to like remain in intimacy with Him because the things that we'll see Him do will be offensive. I mean, I know even just in the shapings of my life now, I get offended at Him. And I'm like, this isn't you. And he's like, how do you know? How do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So just even <laughs> that dynamic of we, we've got to be yeah. abiding in him and know who he is because a lot of the stuff isn't going to line up with the way that we define right. who he is yep. as a church. So, yeah. I think so, a lot of that stuff, too, You, all those three streams are covered a lot in foundations mm -hmm. of biblical night and day prayer and your teachings of that because that's the same thing that sustains us to do. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. to stay in the program. Yeah. Right, stay in the program. It truly is. I mean, right. it, it, it's just that, again, right. highlighting that focus again. Um, because doing that, when we get clarity, when we actually get revelation on who we are, we get revelation on God's plans, we get revelation on destiny, that gives us the clarion call. It gives us the voice of clarity, right? That 1 Corinthians 14, I actually use this. This is my biblical, I haven't read it. This is my biblical foundation for good quality sound in the prayer room. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a sound guy, and so I run sound at church. When I teach how, how to do it, I always have a biblical foundation. This is my biblical foundation of good sound at church, too. But for if a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? <laughs> right? That's the, anyway, it's mm -hmm. kind of a joke, but literally, mm -hmm. it's a great biblical foundation for good sound in the prayer room. Um, but the point is, we have to get clarity on the message. If we're going to be trumpet voices, we have to understand it. And we have to have clarity on who we are in it. And we have to have clarity on what we're called to do in it, right? And then we can sound it and people will follow, right? You lead by example and people will follow the things that they saw you do recently. Okay, so let me say that again. People will do and your followers will follow leaders based on what they've seen them do recently. That's the key word. Oh, yeah, I did that. I used to pray and fast 10 years ago. Why aren't my people praying and fasting? Because you don't pray and fast now. They'll follow what they've recently seen you do, right? And so if you're in the prayer room every day, guess what? People are going to start showing up. If you're preaching out on the street every day, people are going to start showing up and doing the things that you're doing as a leader. And, and that by leader, I mean moms and dads. You've got a family, Right. Okay. You want to? I, I love this. Dave Slyker. Uh, he's a he's a leader in Kansas City. I heard him say this once, and it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Let your kids catch you reading the Word. Let them catch you spending time with Jesus when nobody's around. When they could catch you doing other stuff, let them catch you. I mean, you can set it up, and you can be fake. <laughs> was kind of he was kind of joking in that, but really, like if you're a parent, let them catch you doing that stuff rather than catching you doing other things like getting mad at the TV because it's not working, <laughs> right? Or or getting mad at your crock pot because I I don't like it, I don't know. Right, let them catch you spending time with them. So, let her see. <clears throat> so these trumpet voices are forerunners or pioneers, or you know, we talked about forerunners last, last week. Um, through them, the Lord tells his people how to respond in a national crisis when there's no human remedy in a way that results in, in him intervening with power and mercy and deliverance, okay? So Joel sounded an alarm, sounded the alarm, Joel 1 and 2, and he summoned the people to gather, to fast, and to pray, and to return to the Lord with confidence in his gracious, loving kindness, faithfulness, and, and to return to him confidently knowing that he relents from doing harm. But that, that's his desire, right? So Joel 2 excuse me, 13, surrender your heart, not your garment, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great of kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind. So blow the trumpet, consecrate a fast, so on and so forth. Again, we've said that. Spare your people who are And then afterward, right? Mm. I'm burping the wall. <laughs> so when these prophetic voices give the unpopular very unpopular trumpet blast declaration and proclamation of his coming kingdom, of coming judgment or calamity or whatever. The people, I mean, think of Jonah, okay? The people will respond in one of three ways, okay? So the people, now that's not just the church, that's the people will either, will hear, pray, fast, and repent. And God's response to that is that he will relent from doing harm. If you hear the prophetic declaration of the coming calamity or the coming judgment and all of the people respond and fast and pray, God will actually draw back, right, and, and remove the judgment. The Lord is actually willing to cancel judgment that he decreed in heaven, okay? And he actually desires that. He desires to transform a would-be disaster zone into a revival center. That's the reason he releases disaster is to stir people's hearts to respond in revival, okay? Uh, there are two, and, and I'll just break this down, there's two stages in God's decree of judgment, okay? First, he issues the decree of judgment in the heavenly courtroom, and then he waits, okay? 
And then the second part of God issuing judgment is that uh, he either, A, issues the judgment and sends forth angels to carry it out, or B, he cancels the judgment based on our response. Does that make sense? Kind of how that structure works. So the point is this, a, natural, a national disaster can be stopped. In response to prayer, God heals nations and changes the crisis that would have occurred, okay, um, or delays it. Okay, so the Lord searches, and, and I mean, there's a bunch of verses there you can read. The most well-known one is 2 Chronicles 7.14. Everybody knows this. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Right? God relented from doing harm in response to the people gathering to pray and fast. Okay? Um, just to break down how he structures that, how he releases, like I said, the instant I speak concerning a nation to destroy it, if that nation turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. It can't get any more clear than Jeremiah 18. Like, and we, we argue we can't change God's mind. Pretty sure the Bible says you can. He wants you to change his mind. He wants you to change his thought of what he was going to bring upon it. Okay. Jo jo Josiah himself turned the Lord's heart in a, in a dynamic way in 2 Chronicles. You can read that on your own. <clears throat> the Lord searches for intercessors who will pray for his judgments to be withheld. You can see that in Ezekiel 22 right there. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I have found no one. That saddens the Lord's heart. He also protects those who cry out in intercession. Uh, from his judgment on Jerusalem. You can see that in Ezekiel 9. Again, you can, read, you can read that on your own. But the point is, if the people hear and respond, the Lord relents from doing harm. Now, number two, the other response is that not all the people, but many respond. So many respond to the Lord and say, excuse me, oh, man. Uh, first, sorry, the first was, all of them respond, and the people included. The second is that many respond, particularly the church will respond, to the coming crisis and turn and repent and go to the place of prayer and fasting. And, and God's response to that is that he lessens the judgment that he had decreed. Okay, Particularly in geographic regions, or what I call we call pockets of mercy or cities of refuge. Right? Uh, the Lord desires that none should perish, and so those to those who respond he, rightly, he often lessens or delays the impending judgment due to faithfulness, due to their response. He'll actually lessen it. The fact is seen nowhere more clearly than the, the, the city of Goshen in Israel upon the exodus of Egypt, right? Where did they go? They went to the city of Goshen or the land of Goshen. And while all of Egypt is coming under constant judgment, right, the plagues, God over and over spares a specific pocket or region, Goshen, from those judgments. Now, sometimes he lessened them, and sometimes he completely delivered them in the context. They they didn't hit all, they were not hit by all ten plagues. But they were hit by some of them. <clears throat> so he lessened it, or he removed some. You also, you also see this with prophets, uh, Zephaniah and Amos, speak of this concerning the end times. Uh, <clears throat> I love this Zephaniah quote, gather yourselves together before the decree of judgment is issued, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, and it may be that, that you will be hidden or protected from judgment in the day of the Lord's anger. Right? I mean, that's, I got it kind of broken up there just to read it, but you can go read it on your own. You'll see that in Zephaniah 1.3. That's what he's saying. He's like, hey, if you fast and pray and you gather together, it's possible the Lord will just cover you and you'll be fine, even though it's still going to fall around you. Amos 4.7, is, it's very similar to um, the, the Lord's judgment of, in, in, um, when Jesus talks about one, be, one being in a bed and another being in a bed, and one is taken and the other is not, and two in a field and one is taken and the other is not. That is judgment. It's not the rapture. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about judgment. How do I know that? Because they say, well, how do we know, Lord? Well, he says, where the vultures will be, there the body is, right? Meaning... Those people will die. One will be taken, meaning one will be dead. Well, how do we know which ones will be dead? Because they'll be dead. <laughs> and the vultures will gather. Right? But the point is, God, God's judgment is precise, and he never misses. He's very, very accurate. Amos says that right there. I made, I made it rain on one city, but I withheld the rain from another. 
Why? Because he's so accurate. And those cities could be right next to each other. And one's getting rain and the other one is not. He's very precise. He doesn't miss. Okay, the third way that people respond is that few will listen or respond. And so what God does is actually prepare their hearts and the hearts of their children to go through judgment without offense. This is what we don't want, but it's most often what happens, is that most people, mostly the people don't respond, or the church doesn't respond, or there's a faithful remnant that does. And so God's mercy in that dynamic is to prepare those who will go through the judgment, who responded rightly, to not be offended when it comes. And moreover, their children to not be offended when it comes. So the Lord is after the rending of the heart, like we've said, in response to the words of the prophets. But unfortunately, many generations only rend their garments. And what I mean by that is they have the appearance of changing and shifting their hearts. They have the appearance, right? But it doesn't last, and there's no substance to it. So maybe it was a Christian fad. And so they were on board and really zealous and excited about it. But once all of that lifts, they're not, their heart still isn't changing. Or maybe they were really sincere for a moment or a season, but because it wasn't getting people in the seats or whatever reason, right, they shift and lose focus in the decades of waiting. Because remember, the, the word of the Lord that came to Joel was decades in advance. Decades saying, hey, start now. This is long term. Ready now. This is long term. Remember the, the word of the Lord that came to Moses or Noah? I'm sorry, Noah? How many years in advance did, did he get warning? hundred. And for a hundred years, he has to prophesy of the coming calamity on the earth. And he's, he and only seven other people made it through because nobody listened. But God prepared Noah's sons and Noah to go through the judgment without offense at God. They came out the other side crippled and wounded and leaning, but leaning on their beloved. Make sense? You feel like you got something stern in your name. That's just, that's deep, man. Yeah. Like, the reality of that's hitting me. <laughs> yeah. Decades. Is, think of Moses. Mo, we, I think we said that last week, too. Moses. 40 years. God gave him a word, said, you're going to get a promise of, of a land and a people and a nation. And he spent 40 years on the backside of the wilderness keeping sheep for his father-in-law, who was not really that cool. <laughs> 40 years, then he actually goes and his people get delivered, and then what does he have to do? He spent another 40 years wandering the wilderness, watching all of his generation die because of their unfaithfulness. But God prepared the sons of that generation to go in and receive the promise and walk through that judgment without offense. They came out, all of their fathers were dead because they didn't respond rightly, but they weren't offended at God. They came out leaning on God, crippled, a little bit wounded, a little bit hurt, a little bit limping. I said that two weeks ago. God wants everybody limping in the end, right? He wants everybody to have that little pop in the hip like Israel had, right? And to limp in the end and to have to trust and lean on him. And so he puts a little bit more pressure on. But he brought them up because the few responded. Which few? Joshua and Caleb. Few. Joshua and Caleb responded rightly. And because of the few, God prepared an entire generation to go through judgment on their fathers without offense. This is most often, unfortunately, what happens in response to the prophetic voice coming forward. Most often. It's sad, but it's true, I think. <clears throat> few in Joel's day responded to the perhaps moment of God. Perhaps he would turn and relent. Right? But some of them turn their hearts towards their children in Joel 1, one moment of their lives. Some of them turn their hearts. They produced fruit in spiritual culture that caused their children to stand without offense when the judgment came. Now, I think we see this personally. I think we see this in Daniel. Okay? So, Daniel is a couple of decades, half a generation after Joel, and Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And he's living in the lifestyle, living during the time of Jeremiah. And he's alive when Babylon comes. And he's about 15 years old when the Babylonian invasion comes. That was prophesied for decades. Okay? Now, why do I think his parents responded rightly? Because at 15 years old, Daniel was ripped from his family. He's unicized. Okay? He's made a eunuch. 
and he's shoved into a king's wicked king's court in a completely foreign nation. And what is Daniel's response? What is his lifestyle? Pray and fast. You don't learn that on your own in a vacuum. You are trained and equipped to do that, excuse me, by a family that has done it for decades. There's, unless you're immersed in a culture of prayer and fasting, you don't pray and fast. It doesn't make any sense. And so for Daniel, on his own, at 15 years old, to be plucked out of his homeland and stuck and unicized, which is crazy, in another nation, and to say, I'm going to fast and pray every day and seek the Lord, is absurd unless his family had responded rightly to the prophecy of Joel mm -hmm. and Habakkuk and Zephaniah mm -hmm. and had actually done it for decades. They prepared him to go through the coming judgment, and Daniel was not offended. Daniel was not offended, and he had his manhood removed. At 15 years old, no future wife. He, he knew it at 10, 15 years old. Guess what? I'm, I'm never having kids. I'm never having a family. None of these things. I'm going to serve in this place until I die. And he did not grow offended. And we see. I think we see that in Daniel 1.8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. And then you see it at the end of his life in Daniel 6.10. 70 years later, that Daniel knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Meaning, he's been doing this for 70 years. Gets up, and he prays, and he fasts. So when we think of Daniel, the Daniel fast, Daniel's fast, what do we think What do we think of? 21 days. 21 days, right? Because he fasted for 21 days, and then the angel break, broke through. And so we think, oh, a Daniel fast is when he ate fruits and vegetables for 21 days and didn't eat the delicacies of the table. No, he fasted on just water for 21 days. He lived a lifestyle of only eating fruits and vegetables and not the delicacies of the wine of the king's table. That was all the time. He had a fasted lifestyle, but for an extended period, he went into water. and Because when they say fast in the Bible, they just mean just walk. General, right? That's what he's talking about. So he lived a lifestyle of prayer and fasting all the time. And that does not happen again in a bed. My favorite example of this in the modern day is uh, our good friend, Stephen Nijura. You know, Lauren knows Stephen. Um, Stephen, uh, we actually, first time I met Stephen was I was visiting my soon, my not soon to be wife. I don't know. We were still dating at college. And we were seniors. He's this young sophomore freshman. kid, freshman, and he's just like hitting on Lauren, and like oh. you know, constantly. Constantly, and and then like, became really good friends. I'm like, like, who is this Joker? <laughs> like, what is this guy? And we just, I don't know. We, we, I love the man. We've done ministry stuff together since then. But his context of he was saved into a culture, actually, at IHOP through one thing, I believe, he was saved into a culture where prayer and fasting was normative, like the. the they're in the prayer room all the time, and they fasted all the time. And so to him, normal Christian behavior was you're going to fast twice a week. You're going to do extended fasts throughout the year, and you're going to pray all the time. And so that was normal. And coming from Africa and not coming from America, he didn't understand American church isn't that. And so he, he's weird. But really, he's biblical, and he gets it better than we do. Right? So I love Stephen. He's, so, oh, he's such a great guy. Um, Lauren, you were going to say something? Well, just, uh, it was just reflecting about Daniel. You know, if he was raised in that stuff, then he was raised in, I mean, in law and like knowing God and, you know, being taught that he was the faithful God that delivered the Israelites and all this stuff. And yet, when Babylon, invade, Babylon invaded, God didn't deliver him and his family from the invasion. And I just think about myself. If I, if that had happened to me, I would have been like, you must not be who I've been taught you are because yeah. you didn't deliver my family. That would be my heart reaction. Even right now with all the crap we've been through the last eight years, that still would be my heart's reaction. And that actually makes me tremble because I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, and looking at Daniel, he still went after him in a much more difficult context. And it's just crazy. Well, back to Noah. This hit me several months ago. God did not deliver Noah and his family from the flood. God delivered them 
by using the flood. Delivered them from sin and wickedness and a wicked culture through judgment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They weren't. They went through the flood, but God used the flood as their means of deliverance. That is something to process for a little bit. Are you saying like they made it through the flood, or did they get meaning? Kind of meaning their their way of deliverance was the flood. The flood was their deliverance. It, it wasn't that they they were they were freed from the judgment, like they didn't have to participate in it. No, the judgment itself delivered them from wickedness and sin. But we think, oh, God delivered them from the wickedness of the judgment. No, no, no. The judgment wasn't wicked. The judgment was righteous, and God used the judgment to deliver them from wickedness. I'm sorry, I'm kind of going around in circles. No. But. <laughs> You have to just process that. <laughs> so, another way to say it, another way to say it is I'm, I'm Noah probably, wasn't. It's not like he went to this magic special place where he didn't have to experience the flood. He lived through the flood, but God used the flood to deliver. Right. Okay. The flood okay. that happened. Right. 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 We tend to think of judgment as bad, mm -hmm. right. and judgment is not bad. Judgment is God saying this is right and this is good, and so the the flood was judgment upon wickedness and we think oh god delivered noah from the flood by giving him a boat no the ark wasn't their salvation the flood was their salvation from it's wickedness from so wicked. yeah. they just the ark happened to be part of the way through. <laughs> whatever <laughs> i don't know maybe it's not right <laughs> it's just where my heart was and the lord showed it to me it's like oh because we're dealing with crap right. well like, i know for me it spoke to me Early on, like shortly after I was diagnosed, the Lord had me in Psalm 18, and it's it shows God. The whole 18 is this description of the storm and God coming in the storm. And of course, when we have storms going through our lives, we're like, God, deliver me from the storm. You know, stop the storm, stop the waves. And when the Lord had me in there, He was like, sometimes I come in the storm because that's the greatest show of my power. Amen. So we're a little over, but I'm going to keep going. I want to get through at least this section here. So the point of these things, I keep sharing stories and, and I've got another story about this in common day, like people responding and God relieving or lessening or delaying judgment. And I might share that later, maybe when the camera's off, because um, it could be controversial, but it's... <laughs> but the point of these things and, and what I want to say this under this letter under number three here the third response is that we have to now take a stand to produce a spiritual culture for our children to grow up in that will cause them to stand ignore and rightly respond to jesus as pressure mounts in the coming decades particularly the last three and a half years of ministry particularly in the context of the end times i believe we're approaching the return of jesus it's within a generation whatever that looks like we're in the generation of the Lord's return, whether that's us or our kids. I think it's that close. Um, that could be 50 years. That could be five years. Well, it's probably not five years, but maybe. God, I hope it's closer to 50 than, than five. But it could be closer to five than 50. I don't know. But we have to take the stand now. We have to produce a spiritual culture where our kids will be able to thrive, and the next generation will be able to stand unoffended when they see these things. It's an integral part, letter C, page 7, of the mercy strategy of God. I love that phrase. Mercy strategy of God at the end of the age that the forerunner ministry or those preaching this message, right, that, that that would cause families to be fully alive in God and fully aware that fasting and prayer is to be the predominant spiritual culture of the end time church. It's his mercy right now that he's preparing ministries and he's preparing families to equip their families, mothers and fathers, to equip their children to understand that fasting and prayer will be, once and for all, the predominant culture of the church at the end of the age, where all of our kids will walk in a culture like our friend Stephen, where prayer and fasting is normative and it's the primary way we function as a body, in agreement with heaven, because that's what Jesus does. Do you know that he said he, he goes and he will neither eat nor drink until he comes into his kingdom? Isn't that right? I'm trying to think of the phrase. Um, uh, drink of the vine. Oh, yeah. And basically, if I'm not, you'll have to look it up to prove me on this. But basically, Jesus says when he, go, when he sends, right, he says that I'm not going to eat or drink until 
the marriage supper of the Lamb. Paraphrase it. Until he owns the kingdom of the earth, which means Jesus is fasting right now and has been for a thousand years. <sighs> okay? And he's praying right now. Psalm 2. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. He's the chief intercessor. Jesus' main operation right now is to pray and fast for his beloved, for his brother. That's how he operates in ministry. That's how the kingdom functions. That's how the government of the nations works. Okay? The government of heaven actually functions is through fasting and prayer. And that's what Jesus is doing. And us doing that is agreement with that. And us doing that from now until he comes back, because that's how long we'll do it, is agreement with that reality. Now we'll pray forever. The kingdom will always operate through prayer, but it will operate through fasting until he comes back. Because while the bridegroom is with you, you feast. But when the bridegroom is taken away, you fast. Is he here right now? No. Fast. Right? And remember, he said in Matthew, what did he say? If you fast and pray, do it in secret. No. When you fast and pray. Meaning, you're going to fast and pray. Right? It wasn't an if. It's a when you do it. Do it in secret. So, letter D. God, in his wisdom, gave us the book of Joel to aid us in what message is best for our children to hear in this hour of ministry. Joel sets the example of teaching our children decades out from the crisis to prepare their hearts to not be offended at God, to stay steady in those three streams of revelation we talked about, and to partner with him in the coming events. So, and, and, and you can look at this, when you look at Joel, he says to tell this to your children, right? Moreover, he calls children to fast and pray. You want to know what else he, he makes fast and pray? The animals. <laughs> okay? I mean, I'm... We joked about this. We taught the kids this on Tuesday. Um, but I'm not going to not feed my dog during the fast because I don't want Hershey to eat me. <laughs> and, and he's old and he might. Like, oh, there's a finger. <laughs> so I'm going to feed the dog. Okay. Otherwise, he'd be whining constantly. <laughs> His weakness and yeah, whatever. I won't feed the animals outside. Of whatever. But we're going to fast and pray because that's what we do. That's what we're called to do as partnership. So, Roman numeral four here, seven attributes of sacred assembly. So, we are calling a sacred assembly, right? We are calling a 21 day fast. I'm calling it a solemn assembly or a sacred assembly, the interchangeable word, right? Because we're more than just fasting, which I know just fasting. <laughs> fasting is a lot, okay? We're more than fasting as a community. We're calling actually multiple communities to fast and to gather. We're blowing the trumpet to say, let, and, and I'm looking for, by the way, for March 3rd, oh, it's not up there anymore, like a full-fledged shofar. Our little shofar oh, yeah. just doesn't cut it. We've got this cute little one. It's nice. The girls try to blow it on Tuesday. Like, ping, ping, ping. <laughs> I want, like, the full ram's horn trumpet. Because yeah. that's what he's talking about, is the shofar. Right? Yeah. When they say trumpet, that's what they mean. It's a ram's horn, and it's a beautiful sound, by the way. One of my favorite sounds on the planet is when a skilled man blows the show fire because it's a call to fast and pray that's why they blow it when we went to the response there was like 10 guys mm -hmm. blowing show, show fires mm -hmm. out of the stadium and by the way one of those was darwin found out later really yeah, oh. so um seven attributes of sacred assemblies so what does it look like practically right for us so sacred assemblies are god's prescribed method so we talked about the heart response but there's an actual method to Avert judgment completely, lessen it geographically, or prepare a generation to stand without offense. Okay? In the midst of economic, environmental, military crisis, so on and so forth, right? There's a, an actual method, and that is the sacred assembly. That is the gathering and the fasting and praying. So there, <clears throat> though there clearly could be other expressions with differing characteristics, I want to point out seven mentioned in the book of Joel, particularly in Joel 12 to 17, what a sacred assembly looks like. Now, we are using these at shop to kind of define the coming season, meaning these are the backdrop of the upcoming fast as we look at these. These are the way we're approaching it. Why are we gathering? Why are we fasting? What, are we, what will it look like? So on and so forth. Moreover, shop itself is called to be a continual solemn assembly. I mean, I think we all believe that. We want night and day, 24-7 dynamic. I want, I, I'll take day and night, a morning and a night expression for a season, but we're called as a house to be a continual place of solemn assembly, okay? A solemn gathering, or sacred gathering, um, which is obviously why we have met every Saturday night for nine years. 
to worship and pray. And it's why we do Tuesday nights every night. And it's why we, on Thursday nights a year and a half ago, or a year ago, I said, when we started this, I felt like the Lord said, do it. And I said, until when? And he said, until. <laughs> why? It's a sacred assembly. The call for even ascending in 10 on Thursday nights from 6 to 10 is we're, we're committed to give our Thursday nights to the Lord from now until Jesus comes back. Until whatever. That it's that, That's the sacred assembly name, Daniel. Okay? So just you can see these seven right here in these verses. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, the Lord. So seven attributes of a solemn assembly, or sacred assembly. Number one, they're long term. Okay. That's why shock will continue beyond the 21 days. Right. But 21 days is still a long term period for a lot of our brains. So remember, now again, why is it long term? Because remember, the prophetic declaration of Joel came decades in advance. Our call to, to, to the coming of Jesus is probably years or decades in advance. So we're going to be doing this for decades. Make sense? So it's a long term call. Letter, letter B, it's multi generational. I mean, shop started as a student ministry with the, the premise that it was for college students, we thought. And then it kind of shifted to something else. And then it's, and we are a multi-generational house. We do literally the babies on Friday mornings to the really old grown-ups, y'all, <laughs> on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. There's old people, really old people. We are a multi-generational family <laughs> and gathering. Okay? That but I'm just sorry. I'm just talking about you. <laughs> yes, Stephanie, you're the old one. <laughs> <laughs> Joni, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> She's watching. I hope she pause, rewind. So we are a multi-generational house and expression because Joel calls the solemn assembly to every generation. You see that. The elders, the children, the nursing babes. Okay? Bring them all in. No one is excluded. Okay, every unity requires them all. And actually, the beauty is children are actually raised in that culture. One of our favorite realities of the season that we spent in Kansas City was we just said it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, night and day worship and prayer. It's a fasting community where everybody's engaging in it in some extent, some way, shape, or form. We take Lily to school and her teachers are fasting and praying. And then like they let they get out of school and we go into the prayer room and they're leading prayer sets. And we want, we're like, we want our kids immersed in this culture all the time. We want our kids to be raised in a culture like this that glorifies Jesus all the time. That's what a multi-generational community looks like. That's what a multi-generational sacred assembly looks like. It's, man, when you guys come in here next week or next month during this and we get that taste and see reality, oh, you're going to feel what I felt. Some of you might have tasted it a little bit, being in, coming and going as we do at shop. But when we're here multiple hours a day and, and you come every day, you're going to feel it and you're going to get excited about it. But you're going to want your kids raised in that culture. And the beauty of that sacred assembly is that you can, you can raise your kids in a culture where it's normative. Um, but that will cause them to stand and endure because they see their parents doing it and they see their grandparents doing it and they see their friends' parents doing it and they see their friends doing it. And it's suddenly like they're not the one the square peg in a round hole. Round peg, square hole? Square peg, round hole, whatever. I think you can fit a round peg into a square hole. So square peg, round hole. So they're not that anymore because they see them doing it. That's why we love exposing Lily to like um, popular Christian music that's good. Like what's her favorite singer, the girl, the blonde, that's like curly hair that looks like her? Holland. Holland. Like, yeah. we want to take her to Holland concerts with her friends because then she, there's a realization that other people are walking in this and I'm not weird. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay to love Jesus all the time. Right. Well, or even like her, I mean, she's more into probably Lecrae and Canon now. But yes. <laughs> we'll go to hip hop concerts. I don't care. Uh, all right. Letter C proclamation. Is another aspect of solemn assembly. So there's the blowing of the trumpet. There's singers, musicians. There's moms, entrepreneurs, etc. 
boldly proclaiming the coming judgment, the coming blessing, and God's required response. Meaning, in the midst of this, we're going to be saying, no, 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 guys, just be aware this is what's coming. This is why we're, why we're asking during this season for the Lord to give us prophetic revelation of the end times. Daniel's fast for 21 days. You know what the response was? The book of Daniel, which is the key to end times revelation. If you want to understand what God's going to do at the end of the age, you need to read the book of Daniel. And Daniel got the book of Daniel by fasting for 21 days. That's what the angel brought him. So if you want to understand the end times, fast. That's a biblical precedent, and God answers that. John was fasting on Patmos, and Jesus gives him revelation. How do I know he's fasting on Patmos? Because he's in prison on Patmos. It might not have been a voluntary fast, but he probably wasn't eating much. Okay? Anyway. So proclamation. You have to be proclaiming it. We will be. That's why on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, there are going to be our rallying calls. And Saturday nights. 6 to 10. 6 to 9. I don't know what it looks like. Whatever. Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Saturday nights. We're going to continue doing what we're doing just like we're doing tonight. Rallying during the fast. Saying, this is why we're doing this. This is what the Lord's showing us. This is what we're seeing. This is what we're hearing. Now go and speak it and call people to it. And that's what we're doing as well. We're calling other communities to join in, other ministries, other organizations. There's fasting in a sacred assembly, obviously. But more than just a fast, there's long-term habitual lifestyle of fasting. Okay, so it's a, it's a fasted lifestyle. It's voluntary weakness. Long-term habitual fasting prepares our hearts to experience the grace of God in greater measures. It tenderizes us to the affections of the Father and heightens our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's revelation of our identity, our assignment, and the Father's plans. When we fast, we're going to get revelation of those three streams. It just happens because you're positioning yourself to receive that flow. Okay? I, I use the analogy all the time. If it's raining outside and you want to get wet, what do you do? Did you earn did you earn that rain? No, it was there. If you want to get revelation, what do you do? You position yourself to receive it. Did you earn it? No. It's just the same as walking outside without an umbrella, right? Umbrella would be food in this case. If you don't want to get wet, keep eating. If you want to get wet, fast. Make sense? Prayer is another dynamic. So the cry of intercession in Joel 2 is directly related to the release of blessing or Acts 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Joel 2, 20 to 32 is Acts 2, okay? the day of Pentecost. And the intercession is directly related to that. And moreover, at the end of the age, the intercession of all the saints together in unity will release God's acts of deliverance, his judgment. They'll release his floods. Back to that Noah premise. Okay, When we think about, and we have trouble comprehending this or sometimes believing this, but do you know who released the plagues of Egypt? Moses. Do you know how Moses released them? Prayer. Do you know who ended the plagues of Egypt? Moses. Do you know how Moses ended them? Prayer. God said, I'm going to do this, and so Moses prayed that it would happen, and then God did it. And then, when he was ready to lift, God said, pray that I'll end it, Moses prayed, and God lifted the judgment. Those, those plagues over and over and over again. There is a partnership dynamic. We are not in a season right now, I mean, side note, of imprecatory prayers, meaning we're not praying God release judgment on my enemy. Kick his teeth in, right? We're <laughs> not praying that. We are in a season of mercy. But there is coming a day at the end of the age, at the before Jesus returns, when the bride, the whole church, will stand up and say, God, release that judgment. Jesus break the second seal and Jesus will respond and do it because he wants partnership and he wants us not offended. And at the very end, you know what the bride and, and everyone stands up and sings? It says, righteous are you in your judgments, just in all of your ways. We won't be offended at it. We're actually partnering with him to release his righteous judgments in the earth. So intercession releases the, the end time judgment and justice, just call it justice of God, which are acts of deliverance for us. Th those judgments are God delivering us away from sin, saving us from sinful nature and sinful world. Okay, The prayers of the saints during the tribulation will release the trumpet judgments, the seal judgments, all of those things. 
And then, it, moreover, intercession will also release laborers into the harvest field. Remember, what, what did Jesus say? The harvest is white, the fields are white, the harvest is plentiful. Go and harvest. Is that what he said? No. He said, pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest would ekbalo, would thrust forth laborers in the harvest field. The response to, we have a city right now that is rampant with opioids, right? It is ripe for picking. Do you know some of the easiest people to access are drug addicts? You know who the really easiest people to access are? Prisoners. Why do you think Paul did so great in prison? Why do you think Peter did so great in prison? Why do you think the guys like, oh, we've got a friend, Michael Level, who does prison ministry once a month. He gets like 24 kids saved every time he goes. Why? They're ripe for it. But you know what the answer is? How do we bring in the harvest? We pray for the Lord to raise up laborers for the harvest field. And ekbalo is a means to violently thrust forth. He'll do it. We just have to pray for it. Jesus' answer to the harvest, being ready, is to pray. Just like his an answer to the, to the wicked kings in Psalm 2 is what? Pray. His answer is prayer. I won't break these down, but I'll just say them. Isaiah 2, Isaiah prophesies of a generation that would continue 24-7 in prayer until Jerusalem is established as a praise in all the earth at the time of Jesus' second coming. Jerusalem is not a praise in the earth right now. It is a stumbling block to the nations. It is a heavy weight and a heavy stone. It is not a praise. So 24-7 will continue. And I'm not, again, we've done this other nights. This is a God setting watchman on the wall for the sake of Israel is about God establishing night and day prayer in the nations for Israel, for Jerusalem. And he will do that prior to Jesus' coming back and it will continue until Jerusalem is appraised. Jesus again, Luke 18, also referred to night and day prayer, releasing justice. So prayer is a is an integral part of the sacred assembly. Letter F, number six, whatever you want to say, is urgency. So how do you sustain urgency for 21 days? How do you sustain urgency for a year? God is, at, God is asking us to sustain our urgency for decades. He's warning us now of what's coming in decades. How do you keep that urgent? Because urgency is important. Urgency is sustained by giving our hearts to the perpetual sacred assemblies until he returns. When we come back into this place over and over again, whether it's here or elsewhere, when we engage in the corporate fast dynamic, what do we receive? We receive those three pieces of revelation that sustain us in urgency. When all the pressure comes from underneath and the power comes down, here, I'm going to draw this out for you, and then we'll, we'll basically finish. Hope you got all this. I remember Craig Cook was a great friend of ours and a mentor. He drew this out once. So you've got three. It's going to be really cheesy, but... You got three streams. This is a river, okay? Three streams. You've got identity. You've got end times. And what was the third one? Destiny. 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 Function or assignment. Okay? These are revelation from God. That you get in the place of prayer and fasting and seeking Him, okay? But they will sustain you when these converge, okay? When pressure comes, and power comes. Power. <laughs> power comes from above. That will sustain a little guitar player. <laughs> in the place of prayer. Here's my strings. Until the last seven years of human history, until Jesus comes back. Okay? When these streams converge and you walk in that, pressure's going to come and it's going to beat against you, and the power of God's going to come, and you're going to get bolstered up and lifted up and, like, really proud. But then Paul says, but I was given a thorn in the flesh because of my abundance of revelations, right? And so, but these realities will sustain you through the process. That will sustain you. These produce urgency in you. Understanding this keeps urgency before you. When we understand 
the time in which we live, the season, the hour, the day of what's happening when we're aware, we get urgent about what we're doing. And then we operate in these realities, our function, our identity, that's holiness, is a, is a dynamic piece of that. And it's also one of the seven attributes of uh, sacred assemblies. Holiness is a focal point of what's happening in the midst of it. And you see that in verse 16, sanctify the congregations, right? Sanctify the congregation. And, and even the urgency you see in, in uh, verse 16, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and let the bride from her dressing room. Do you understand how urgent this fast was? That it was, no, don't even complete the wedding ceremony, cancel it, come pray and fast instead. That's what's happening. And Joel says, no, drop everything even your wedding that you spent twenty thousand dollars on and preparing for and whatever i mean in that day they were spending lots on it right there's a big preparation it's a seven day ceremony and then like an extent whatever no 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 cancel it all come pray and fast because this is really important it's extremely urgent that we do this and then again Sanctify the congregation. There is a holiness dynamic to it. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. They're, the process of weeping between the porch and the altar is the process of they're, they're doing the sanctification rituals of the tabernacle. Okay? And the Lord says, hey, come before me with weeping and mourning and fasting on behalf of the people. Weep between the porch and the altar. Holiness of heart is the sanctifying of the people. We are strangers and pilgrims with minds set on things above, operating with pure motives from a place of humility while we exalt Jesus. So these are seven aspects, seven focal points, seven things that are happening in the midst of the sacred assembly that we're doing. These are things that we're seeking and, or that will even come, but we actually do need to seek them. We need to set our hearts on God and show me who I am. Show me your plans. Show me your functions, the function that you have for me, my destiny, my assignment. If we get focused on these two without this one, we go off on tangents of, um, I know I love Jesus, man. I'm, we're amazing. He's my brother. I'm his brother. We're homeboys. Yeah, woo. And I get to like glorify him by this assignment and this assignment and this ministry and this thing and, da -da 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 -da. and we lose sight of this and the urgency of the hour. And what the, if we focus again on these two, we get caught up in the weird movements that are happening in the church right now that we've talked about before. You understand what I'm talking about? Like the um, loving God loves me, right? Because of me, God loves me. And yet we don't actually contend for breakthrough. We don't contend for revival. We get caught so caught up in sonship that we forget about his holiness if we get focused on these two, right? But if we keep this then as well before us, great. Or if we just do this and this, and we don't know who we are, we operate in fear-mongering. You understand? You know, like, so we have to do all three of these things. Uh, identity and function without end times and the urgency of the hour. We, we get into... Um, oh, I've got a friend that, that went through this process and my heart still aches for him because I really don't know where he is with the Lord. He got so caught up in who he was for the Lord and his function that he left all ministry entirely, you know, to do whatever he's doing, which I don't really know what it is because he lost sight of the earth as well. It's so far off. Things are continuing the same as they always have been. That's not important anymore. And now is he even following Jesus? I don't know. So we have to keep these three things before us in the process of this. 